This is the Best Health Podcast, brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health in partnership with MedCost. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the Best Health Podcast. Um, Justin Gomez here with Wake Forest Baptist Health. I want to thank everyone for listening and tuning in um, to this episode. Um, we're going to we're gonna talk about uh, shoulder injuries and recovering from shoulder injuries and type different types of shoulder injuries. Um, I know uh, with with people trying to stay active uh, during this time, um, we want to make sure that people are doing that in a healthy way. So with us is a special guest we have today, uh, Dr. Brian Waterman, who is one of our sports medicine physicians through Wake Forest Baptist Health. And um, he has a lot of really great insight and years of, of experience in, in helping people's shoulders get back to 100%. So welcome, Dr. Waterman. How are you, sir? Hey, good afternoon, Justin. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about, um, you know, some different types of, of common injuries you see in your clinics and in your OR. Um, but just real quick before we get into that, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and a, a little bit back background of how long you've been with Wake Forest Baptist Health and um, why you're a sports medicine doctor? Yeah, perfect. No, thanks for the opportunity. It's certainly a passion of mine taking care of active people with active problems, and that takes a, a wide range. Uh, I did some of my training in the military uh, through both Texas Tech University and uh, William and Beaumont Army Medical Center in El Paso, Texas. So had the great honor and privilege of, of serving in the military and serving those uh, folks that are, are defending our country and our freedom. So mm -hmm. an incredible honor. And uh, served um, uh, 11 years in the military and then subsequently after uh, years of practice within that context, I got out and went to Chicago where I completed my uh, sports fellowship at Rush University and uh, helped to take care of the Chicago Bulls, the White Sox, um, some of the junior league hockey there, as well as a wide range of, of athletes to include professional dance um, and uh, a lot of performance artists. So really a cool opportunity to delve into that. And thereafter, I was really looking back to get um, to the Mid-Atlantic region. And this area is home to both my wife and I as military brats. And we really were uh, looking to, to find an opportunity, and thankfully, um, the opportunity at Wake Forest came available. Uh, so I'm in my third year here now. Uh, I'm currently the Chief and Fellowship Director of Sports Medicine. I'm one of the team physicians for Wake Forest University Baseball and Soccer. Help take care of the Winston-Salem Dash, and I also do some work with U.S. Ski and Snowboard. So kind of a diverse group of uh, of of sports medicine obligations and responsibilities. Wow, that's very cool. That's very cool. Um, uh, I, I want to talk about uh, a couple of specific um, types of injuries that maybe you all have been seeing a fair amount here recently um, coming through the clinics and coming through the, the OR. Um, but before I do, I do want to just um, give a, a quick plug and shout out to um, a pretty unique uh, opportunity and uh, setup that we have uh, in conjunction with Wake Forest Baseball since you brought that up and that is uh, the pitching lab uh, that is newly opened at Couch Ballpark. Um, so uh, if you wouldn't mind, I know I know we didn't necessarily previous talk about this, but just give a quick uh, uh, 30 second or 60 second overview of, of how cool the pitching lab is and how it's helping young athletes. Yeah, and this was really the, the brainchild of some of my predecessors and really realized under our watch, uh, Coach Walter, who's the head baseball coach at Wake Forest University, uh, as well as my chairman, Andy Komen, were really instrumental in bringing this uh, venture into reality. And what it is, is it's an in-house facility for biomechanical analysis of uh, young throwers. Um, those throwers can be anybody from a, a 12-year-old, 13-year-old young individual, all the way up through the professional ranks. We've begun consulting with several of the Major League Baseball organizations as well as colleges and universities in the region, 
And really what we're trying to tackle is looking at ways that we can move the needle on throwing related injuries. As we know, there's a high preponderance or a high uh, prevalence of uh, injuries, mostly of the upper extremity in baseball athletes, mm -hmm. uh, many of which involve both the shoulder and to a lesser extent the elbow, but they have significant gravity as it relates to one, a, a, a person's baseball career, as well as their uh, quality of life. And so what we're trying to do is find ways that we can improve the efficiency and the performance of those individuals. Mm -hmm. We use state-of-the-art equipment, including our 16 cameras set up to catch slow motion uh, capture, as well as using several markers on the, uh, on the thrower or athlete uh, to try to inform how they're delivering the ball and how that compares to what we think is, is the most normal and most healthy way of throwing. We also use force plates in the mound in order to uh, guide how people redistribute their weight. And so putting all those together is really a unique and invaluable tool, not only for our deacons, but, uh, but also for folks that come from the community that we're trying to preserve from having these throwing related injuries. That is really awesome. And uh, I, I think it's a pretty unique setup uh, with the technology and, and the staff we have there and the partnership with uh, a Division I University with Wake Forest University. So um, if people uh, are interested in learning more about that, they can just go to wakeforestpitchinglab.com and uh, there's, there's more information about uh, that. And we're really fortunate to have uh, this type of resource right here in, in our community. So um, you did mention uh, that uh, the studying the biomechanics, uh, you want to help uh, prevent injury uh, in the upper extremity, but sometimes that does happen um, either with with uh, youth athletes or, or professional athletes uh, or um, some of us who fancy uh, that we are athletes on, on the weekend or in our rec softball league. Um, so I think one of the common uh, shoulder injuries that we wanted to chat about for a minute is uh, the labral tears. Um, so if you just want to talk about um, what what is that and how common uh, are you seeing that around here? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's it's certainly something that I think starts with a kind of a fundamental understanding of the anatomy. To, so to take a step back for a minute, mm -hmm. think about the, the shoulder as a ball and socket joint. You know, there's mm -hmm. the humerus or arm bone. And then there's the glenoid, which is the socket, and that's part of your scapula. Um, the scapula kind of forms your shoulder girdle, and there's a lot of intricate motions that occur around that ball and socket joint. Part of that ball and socket joint is brought together by the labrum, and if you imagine the labrum is kind of like a gasket that goes around the socket okay. uh, in order to hold it in place, almost like a suction cup. Mm -hmm. You have the same type of relationship, for instance, in your hip. And um, that suction cup helps to maintain that shoulder in place because there's more range of motion about the shoulder than any other joint in the body. So you can imagine with that degree of freedom or motion about that shoulder and the very intricate motions you go through when you do um, uh, throwing a football or delivering a fastball uh, or just playing catch with your kids, um, there's a lot of stresses and strains that go across it. And sometimes that can result in a labral tear or a partial detachment. You lose that suction seal, that gasket becomes more unstable. And, uh, and so typically we think about those in three different categories. Mm -hmm. There's the one on the top, which we call the superior labrum or top part of the labrum. And taken together, it develops an acronym called a slap tear. In a sense, that's almost like a four letter word, word in, in baseball, a slap tear. Um, because it can be a really significant injury and negatively impact throwing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's commonly an overhead athlete population. Um, but you can also get tears in the front or back part of the labrum, what we call the anterior and posterior labrum. And that's typically associated with more shoulder instability episodes. So your shoulder dislocating about 96, 97 percent of the time, you can you can knock off a piece of that labrum in the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, that results in that anterior labral tear. In terms of the back part of the labrum or posterior labrum, that's more common in, in selected uh, patients. So, for instance, we see that a lot in football athletes, particularly uh, defensive linemen, 
because they bring their hands up into a forward flexed position and they have a lot of loads going through the back. Mm -hmm. We also see it in uh, performance athletes, heavy weightlifters, um, folks involved in mixed martial arts, those that do a lot of grappling, and then also our first responders, our police, firemen, and military service members. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes those can you know, combine with each other for unique labral tears. Yeah. The gasket all depends on where it's torn, kind of dictates the treatment, and uh, we try to use specific exam maneuvers to try to find those individuals that have these. Well, um, and you can see, I mean, kids and adults uh, can can have this type of injury, correct? Yeah, very often. Very often you see these. Uh, it's certainly not something that has just a, a monopoly in one patient population. In fact, superior labral injuries or slap tears can be something that we see in the young throwing athlete. Mm -hmm. And actually, the rate of slap tears increases in, uh, incrementally with each decade of life. In fact, there may be a gradual detachment that occurs in that labrum over time, and that can ultimately result in some other problems, um, oftentimes increasing stress about the rotator cuff or more mobility in the biceps tendon, which anchors onto the labrum in the socket. And, uh, and so very often these slap tears can be associated injuries, particularly in a thrower. Gotcha, gotcha. So... And you don't have to be, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, a, you know, I don't have to be throwing a 90, out, 90 mile an hour fastball to, to experience this injury, right? This would be, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to do something around the house up on the ladder or, or yeah. cleaning up uh, spring cleaning around my yard, I can mess up my shoulder like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say there's three different types of, of slap tears that we commonly see. And most commonly is kind of a more degenerative or attritional injury. Mm -hmm. It's one from overuse. And so it's just repetitive stress or mm -hmm. rotation about the shoulder that results in a, a gradual wear and tear that causes loosening of it. Sure. But you can't have those associated with traumatic falls. And typically that's a fall on your outstretched arm. Mm. It loads all the way up into your shoulder. And so you force that ball into the, the top part of your socket. And when it does that, it has a tendency to shear off a little bit of that labrum. If you think about it like a golf ball on a golf tee, it's just forcibly pushing off that rim. And it takes a little bit of that cartilage with it and some of that grisly soft tissue that uh, comprises the labrum. Gotcha. So how would, you know, when someone comes into a, your clinic uh, for, for an appointment, you know, they're, they're probably saying, oh, my shoulder hurts. They're, uh, how, what, what are the symptoms we need to be looking out for that might, might uh, lend itself to this specific injury? Um, you know, is it a limited range of motion? Is it pain in a certain area? Um, how do you go about looking to see if it's a, a labral tear? Yeah. No, absolutely. And it, you know, a lot of the times you're, you're um, talking about patients in risk groups. I would say, generally speaking, if you're under the age of 40 or 50, you're more likely to have a labral tear than you are a rotator cuff tear. Mm -hmm. People always come in with a concern of a rotator cuff injury, but mm -hmm. when in fact they often have these labral injuries, which are more overuse in nature. So the first symptom is most commonly pain. That pain can be during daytime activities. It can also be at rest with problems that sleep at night. Mm -hmm. One of the more specific things you get is more mechanical symptoms, what I would call, call it. Mechanical symptoms are popping, catching, maybe that radiating pain that's starting from the top part of your shoulder and extending down, and uh, just soreness that uh, causes you to avoid certain ranges of motion, sometimes leading to stiffness. I would say the labral tears in the front and the back, the ones that are more sh associated with shoulder instability or shoulder dislocations, mm. those, those do also present with pain, but oftentimes those are resulting in, in recurrent or, or uh, instability that happens again. So feeling like your shoulder is about to pop out of place, or maybe it partially slides out and then slides back in, we call that a subluxation. And that's very common, particularly in a younger individual. Um, to have a recurrent shoulder instability event. That can be upwards of 80% in a high-risk uh, patient population. And so we always encourage people, if you have shoulder dislocations, have that looked at because that's something that changes with the more instability events you have over time. Yeah, yeah, 
that makes sense, Doc. Um, so, Dr. Waterman, you know, as we're talking and, and someone's come in and you said, okay, we think, you know, you, you've done your analysis and, and gotten, you know, any sort of um, uh, testing done at, at any of our clinics uh, for sports medicine and orthopedics. So you've identified that it's a labral tear. So now what? What are people that they automatically have to go in for surgery? Are there non-surgical options? Yeah. I know when someone, you know, they hear tear in, in a joint that probably kind of jars them a little bit, but um, what are the, some, of, some of the different ways that you can treat them? Yeah, what I would say is first off, uh, and everybody's got a little bit of this now, there's cabin fever. People are getting out there and being active. They're doing these tasks around the house. They're being more physically active with their kids. It's starting to get nice out. And so they're starting to test the limits of some of their athletic uh, prowess. And, uh, and so we have folks coming in with these, these related injuries. I would say you can't put a premium on getting a good physical exam of the shoulder. Mm-hmm. A lot of people want to jump straight to MRI, but I'll tell you, the broader majority of information I get can be really gleaned from a, a really solid physical exam. Because then that really tells me not just what I see on an MRI, we treat patients. And so the exam is going to tell me something far different than the MRI. You start with that exam, that can often tell me whether they have instability, whether they have symptoms consistent with a slap tear, Mm -hmm. tell me a little something about their range of motion, and also it tells me some ways that maybe we can modify their their shoulder function to uh, make them feel better or diminish their symptoms or, you know, potentially allow them to return back to their activities. Um, Imaging, we often use basic x-rays in order to evaluate the bony foundation of the shoulder. But that doesn't really show us the soft tissues. And so there are some are circumstances where we undertake an MRI if their symptoms fail to improve. But I would say the broader majority of these, upwards of 60, 70 percent of these, particularly slab tears, will get better with conservative treatment alone. And so very often I'll use some element of either injections or anti-inflammatories. Um, and oftentimes if I can control the way their shoulder blade moves in space, or improve selective rotator cuff strengthening and improve some of the coordination of it, then we can really get them back to into full activities. And so it's yeah. not uncommon I'll use an injection as both a diagnostic tool, but then also a therapeutic tool, something that decreases their pain and allows them to gradually reintegrate themselves into um, either sporting activities or, or their recreational or occupational activities. Yeah, you know, that's really the goal. You know, we want to get people back to the activities that they want to that they want to participate in. If that's gardening or playing golf or you know, if they're on a on a youth team or an adult uh, sports team of some sort. Um so it's good to hear that there's not just, you know, if it's a tear, there's other other therapies and other treatments besides surgery, but um should surgery be needed, you all are, are well equipped to, to treat the patient that way, correct? Yeah, I would say, you know, obviously I'm biased in this regard, but I believe Wake Forest Baptist Health has, has really an elite sports medicine and shoulder uh, group that is, is trained in the full gamut of these shoulder injuries. And so it's important to go somebody that sees a lot of these and really has a contemporary paradigm for how to treat them. Um, yeah. Our, cha- our, our treatment um, algorithm has changed significantly over time. And uh, a lot of us have learned from our mistakes. Uh, whereas traditionally we used to perform a lot of repairs of slap tears, over time we've realized that that may not be as reproducible a surgery as we once thought. Mm-hmm. It was first described by Jimmy Andrews, and then subsequently uh, we learned the classification for it. But increasingly, we're looking at alternative ways to treat it, either with simple trims or potentially treating the biceps tendon as a primary way of addressing that slap tear. And so shoulder arthroscopy, small keyhole or poke hole surgery that enters into the shoulder, fills it with fluid, and then you perform these surgeries with small tools inserted through cannulas in the shoulder, Mm -hmm. have really allowed us to completely change the paradigm on how we treat these. And uh, whether that's repairing the labrum, trimming it, 
treating some of the surrounding areas of damage, very often we're able to restore people upwards of 90, uh, 95% of the time to their pre-injury activity. And uh, when you look at some of the historic rates, and that's part of the reason why people are scared when they hear labral tear, the historic rates of returning people to function, they could be as low, if you're a high um, value thrower or pitcher, could be as low as 40 to 60%, which is very discouraging. Yeah. We've been able to flip the script on that, especially with a lot of our work with the throwing athletes, and show that upwards of 70, 80, 90%, even at the highest ranks, we're able to have you to return to your pre-injury level of activity. And so that's important for us. That's that's great. That's great news. And so as these advances in technology and, and treatment methods have progressed um, in recent years, you know, this might be a harder question to answer, but what is the typical um, time of healing or recovery if someone comes in with a, a labral tear? I know it might vary based on age or yeah. other factors. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, uh, our discussions tend to be largely the same wherever your labrum tear is. I would say a lot of it is is uh, contingent on what the patient does and what their activity level is. If, uh, if you're somebody that's trying to get back to golf or trying to get back to a desk job, that's something that we can get pretty close to normal by a fairly quick period of time, maybe even somewhere around 12 weeks. For returning you to a sporting level function, mm -hmm. I'll typically allow people to get back um, to a throwing progression or some weightlifting around uh, four to uh, four and a half months. For a full recovery, whether that's stabilizing a dislocated shoulder or addressing a slap tear, mm -hmm. um, that can be anywhere between 12 and 24 weeks after surgery. A okay. key therapist is important, and uh, we do all progression-based uh, protocols. So you have to meet a certain benchmark or, or goal at a certain time point. And if it takes you longer, that's fine. If you make it quicker, that's okay, too. So everybody is pretty much on a uh, spectrum. I would say, generally speaking, it's probably somewhere between four to six months, um, maybe a little bit longer if you're a high-demand thrower. Okay, that's good info. Dr. Waterman, as we wrap up here, um, talking about um, this shoulder injuries and, and labral tear and recovery, you know, you mentioned uh, physical therapy and, and recovering a, a, as part of the treatment if there is surgery or, or maybe not even surgery. But, um, you know, I guess I want to close with if you just want to touch on kind of the comprehensive team approach that y'all take um, within the clinics and the, the sports medicine um team that y'all have in place to just walk through the patient through the entire yeah. process to get them back to feeling well? Yeah, no, absolutely. It is uh, much like uh, sports, you know, sports medicine is absolutely a team sport. Really, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the, uh, the huge value that the therapists play. So very often when we're getting these referrals in, we're getting them from primary care providers, pediatricians, mm -hmm. family, friends, and so very often they can get same day or next day appointments. Even in times like these, we have Saturday clinics and you can easily get in touch with us through our, uh, either our online platform or calling through our access center. And it just starts with somebody having symptoms that seem to have lasted longer than you think they should. Um, and uh, they want to have it evaluated. And so they come in and are seen by us in clinic. We work with a whole range of uh, um, uh, physician assistants, athletic trainers, other allied health staff, and we work to evaluate you. Mm -hmm. If that's something that we think could benefit from an injection, very often we're able to do that in the office. If it's something where we want to try oral medication or some other treatments, we can certainly do that. But very often we'll use our crack physical therapy team to try to uh, improve that. The nice part is we've got veteran physical therapists that are very skilled in a lot of these kind of niche subspecialty areas. If you're a big golfer, we have people that have PGA level training. If you're somebody that does endurance athletics, we have folks for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have therapists that can really address the full spectrum from the weekend warrior to elderly folks to, uh, to the young athletes. And, uh, and so they're a huge part. I would say they're maybe even a more important part than the surgeon. Whether that's surgery or non-operative care, 
we work together as a group in you know one point of care setting. So you can come in here, you can get your brace, you can get your injection, you can get your clinical care, your physical therapy, and all that can be done under one roof um, at our sports medicine headquarters at either 1901 Mooney Street near Haynes Mall or any of our outlying locations. And and so that's something we've been really proud of and uh, completely remodelized modeled the space. Um, for a full, um, you know, return to the sidelines or return to the field recovery process. That's uh, that's very reassuring. I, that's a great word um, about that team approach, Dr. Waterman. Um, I want to uh, just let people know if if they think they need if they're feeling some sort of shoulder pain or or limitations with their shoulder, um, they can easily call three three six seven one six wake. Um, and they'll direct them to the right clinic uh, based on where they live. Um, or we have lots of great information uh, on uh, the website at wakehealth.edu slash sports medicine. Um, and you can see all of our sports medicine providers, including Dr. Waterman and our various locations um, all over the triad in Northwest North Carolina. So um, definitely can provide that resource for people if they need it. Um, Dr. Waterman, this has been really informative. I, I've uh, I've learned things today, and I hope people listening um, have learned some new things as well. And um, uh, thanks for what you do. And I was remiss in, at the beginning of the podcast to say thank you for your service as well when you're in, in the United States Army. We appreciate that. And um, thanks for, for looking after the patients in our area and getting them back to being active. Yeah, it's one of the most honorable things we do is taking care of our patients, and those special relationships are really what make us enjoy our job. So um, thank you for calling light to this important uh, area uh, of shoulder surgery and shoulder injuries, and uh, we look forward to meeting you in clinic. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Waterman, and thanks, everyone, for listening. We appreciate it, and uh, until we uh, chat next time, please be well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Best Health Podcast brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health. For more wellness info, check out wakehealth.edu and follow us on social media. Wake Forest Baptist Health, the gold standard of healthcare.